Okay, thank you for joining us, everyone. My name is Julia. Uh, we are pleased that you all could join us for our third lecture in the 12 week didactic series. Uh, this series brings you lectures from experts in the field co covering different topics each week. The Neuropsychology Didactic Series was created by trainees and early career neuropsychologists to provide free high quality didactic opportunities for the international neuropsychology community. Before we start, there's um, a few disclaimers that we just have to go over. Um, this training is not meant to replace formal education in neuropsychology and the views of the speakers are their own and do not reflect official endorsement of any institution or organization. Questions for our speaker can be submitted via the Q&A box, which is in the lower left of your screen next to the chat. Um, we'll have time for questions in the last 10 minutes of the talk. So questions submitted via the Q&A box will be addressed to the speaker. Um, a recording of today's lecture will also be provided via email later on this week. Um, let's see. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Emily Duggan for today's lecture on cultural neuropsychology frameworks and intelligence testing in Latin America. Dr. Emily Duggan is a clinical and research postdoctoral fellow at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. She completed her PhD in clinical psychology at the University of Victoria and her pre-doctoral internship at the Charleston Consortium. She is a former Veneer Scholar and recipient of the Anne Anastasi Graduate Student Research Award for work in differential psychology and psychometrics. Dr. Duggan's research focuses on developing valid and reliable neuropsychological tools and frameworks, particularly in the areas of intelligence, executive functioning, and cross-cultural assessment in neuromedical and normative populations. Dr. Duggan has led many, many multinational research projects and has worked as a research consultant in South America and in, in, in industry settings. She is the consulting editor for psychological assessment and is the chair of the Society for Clinical Neuropsychology or Division 40 of APA's Association of Neuropsychology Students in, and Trainees, or ANST. She also serves as the trainee representative to SCN Division 40's Education Advisory Committee and the Clinical Neuropsychology Synarchy. Without further ado, I'll let Dr. Duggan take it away. Thanks, Julia. Had to unmute myself there. Um, all right, thank you so much. Um, just before we get started here, um, I would just like to go over a couple of disclosures on the next slide. Um, so I have no commercial disclosures. Um, I do have uh, some funding sources I'd like to acknowledge who's um, supported a lot of the work that I've done. And all the data that you'll see um, in this presentation is um, provided with permission. And next slide. Um, so overall today, um, I would like to um, just go over what the objectives are going to be. Um, so we're going to start with a very brief history of cultural neuropsychology, and then I'm going to transition into describing cultural neuropsychology frameworks. And I'm going to use the examples of intelligence assessment in Latinx populations to help illustrate some of the ideas and ways to overcome some barriers in cultural neuropsychology. Um, in this lecture, I'm going to go over a lot of resources, and the name of the game in uh, cultural neuropsychology is knowledge. So to help you out, I've put together um, a lot of these resources that I'm going to talk about into a PDF document um, that I believe they're going to be able to share with you in this chat, and then it will also be available on our website, um, the No Neuropsychology website. Um, so if you want to look more closely at these resources while I'm going over them, um, you're more than welcome to do that um, once they send it out. The next slide. So let's start off with a brief overview of cultural neuropsychology. So since the inception of scientific psychology, there's always been an interest in understanding cultural influences on psychological phenomena. So for example, Wundt uh, wrote a multi-volume book in 1900 about cultural psychology that was called Volker psychology or the people psychology. Um, neuropsychology appeared relatively later in the history of the behavioral sciences, but Alexander Luria, 
who's also been considered the father of modern neuropsychology, was particularly interested in understanding the impact of culture, education, and literacy on cognition. For example, his research on intellectual abilities in Uzbek people in the early 1930s was a major contribution to cultural psychology and neuropsychology. But despite this early emphasis on culture within psychological and neuropsychological sciences, Western neuropsychology placed relatively little focus and emphasis on cultural variables. And in fact, in 1992, Dr. Charles Matthews addressed this issue in his presidential address of the International Neuropsychological Society. Um, he acknowledged that INS had provided support for the development of neuropsychological societies in many Latin American countries. And in describing the current state of neuropsychological research, he said, quote, a very limited kind of neuropsychology, appropriate to only a fraction of the world's population, is presented in, to the rest of the world as if there could be no other kind of neuropsychology, and as if education and cultural assumptions on which neuropsychology is based were obviously universals that applied everywhere in the world. This was a very historic moment. And it's worth noting, though, that at this time, the term cultural neuropsychology had not yet even been used. Going on to the next slide. It's likely that Alfredo Ardila, who trained under Alexander Luria, first used the term cross-cultural neuropsychology in a 1993 paper called Direction of Research in Cross-Cultural Neuropsychology. And it's during the following years that some major books on cross-cultural assessment in neuropsychology were published, and a significant amount of research to date has been devoted to cross-cultural and cultural neuropsychology. Um, this includes the research by Alfredo Ardila, Monica Roselli, Jennifer Manley, Monica Rivera Mint, Anna Brickman, um, Adam Brickman, Tony Puente, David Fuji, Desiree Bird, Miguel Arce, and so many more people than I could possibly name in this short presentation. Um, additionally, there's been many organizations that have been established to further non-Western neuropsychology, such as the Latin Association for Neuropsychology, or ALAN, the Latin American Society of Neurology, the Hispanic Neuropsychological Society, and the Asian uh, Neuropsychological Association, just to name a very small few. Um, much has also been done to advance cultural psychology and neuropsychology, such as through training and practice statements through our professional associations and um, outstanding uh, educational programs and clinics uh, at many institutions, including at UCLA's Hispanic Neuropsychiatric Center for Ex Excellence. And while there's been so much exciting progress in the area of cultural neuropsychology, there's still significant room for improvement. Next slide. Next slide, please. So why am I using this specific term, cultural neuropsychology? Well, let's clarify some terminology. I think uh, we advanced one too many slides here. Thank you. Um, so, some people use the term cultural neuropsychology, while others more recently have been using the term cultural neuropsychology. And this is a subtle but important distinction. So the term cross-cultural neuropsychology connotates the application of neuropsychology from one culture to another culture. While the term cultural neuropsychology connotates the application of neuropsychology that's appropriate for a given culture. And so for this reason, you'll see that many people are shifting away from the use of the term cross-cultural neuropsychology and more frequently using the term cultural neuropsychology. But why do we even need to specify cultural neuropsychology in the first place? Shouldn't all neuropsychology be mindful and appropriately practice, practicing within cultural contexts? And the answer, I think, is yes, um, it should. And we should definitely get to the point where cultural neuropsychology is synonymous with neuropsychology. But until that's the point of practice, it's worth noting the differences. So why aren't these terms synonymous? Well, first, neuropsychology is limited by a lack of culturally appropriate tools. We all know that norms are not created equal, 
but the overwhelming majority of research and test development has focused on Western samples. And the lack of appropriate measures and norms is regularly cited as one of the top barriers for non-Western neuropsychologists um, and those neuropsychologists who work with diverse populations. Second is the issue of the application of cultural uh, neuropsychology in a very complicated world. With increasing globalization, people rarely fit into neat, tidy little boxes clearly labeled with the name of the norms that you need to use or the test that you should give. And in a nutshell, that makes things very messy. People are highly diverse in their languages, where they've lived, and the experience they've had. And this all affects how their brains work and how they'll interact with you on testing. So how do we make informed decisions and practice the best neuropsychology that we can in a culturally complex context. Next slide. All right. Sorry, my screen got messed up here. There you guys go back. All right. Um, so this is where cultural neuropsychology frameworks come in. Um, you will see this defined in the literature in many different ways, but in my ideal cultural neuropsychology framework, it's a combination of knowledge and action. So you need a dynamic set of competencies that you're consistently improving and refining over time, but you also need a game plan for how to approach all of your work, whether it's clinical or research, in a culturally responsive manner. So the framework that I work from has four pillars. First, you should develop your knowledge by reviewing the literature and the ethical guidelines. Second, you need to do your cultural homework. It's imperative to make an effort to understand the cultural effects of each situation you encounter. And if you don't think that culture is applying to the current situation that you're in, uh, I encourage you to look more carefully because culture uh, permeates every single thing that we do as a neuropsychologist. Third, all decisions that you make in your work need to be supported by an empirical basis. And fourth, it's critical that you're mindful of your own assumptions. So for example, one longstanding myth has been of the idea of culture-free tests or that maybe that there's tests that are nonverbal and are somehow culture free and we would expect the same performance across many different populations. And that myth has been um, dispelled widely throughout the research literature. So you need to be very aware of what your biases are and what your assumptions are when coming into any given situation. Next slide. So if you're thinking all of this is a little bit overwhelming, um, don't worry um, because I'm gonna walk through some kind of practical things to help you out. So first, there are many guidelines that all trainees and practicing neuropsychologists should be very familiar with, no matter what area of practice you're in. And so I've included these on the resource page that they sent out to you in the chat. Um, and that will also be available on the website. Um, if I listed them on the slides here, it would be more than three slides just for the resources alone. Um, so I encourage you to look at those carefully, and if you have not gone over them in your training program or as part of your education so far, I highly recommend that you kind of select one a week and take the time to review them because they're very important. Additionally, David Fuji also just gave a really lovely webinar on Friday with the Asian Neuropsychological Association. And in his talk, he very thoroughly reviewed the uh, American Education Research Association, or ERA, Standards for Education and Psychological Testing. Um, and he walked through a very clear clinical example of a, what applying those principles and guidelines looks like in practice. Um, so for you to access the webinar, I believe all you need to do is go to the ANA website. So that website is the-ana.org. And on the top, you'll see um, a part that says student committees. And so you go to that section and then you go down to webinars and um, you'll be able to view it there. Also, if you're not yet a member of this organization or its sister organization, the Hispanic Neuropsychological Association, I highly recommend that you become one. 
Um, you don't have to have Asian neuropsychology neuropsych or Hispanic neuropsychology being an area of your absolute focus in order to benefit greatly from the amazing work that these organizations are doing. Um, so kind of back to the ethical guidelines and um, practice standards. One thing that's worth pointing out is that despite all of these resources that our professional organizations have put together for us, offering us guidance, um, it's worth noting that there's still significant debate on what applying them looks like in the real world. Um, and this is really common, particularly in situations where you have an individual or a population of people um, that are falling into a gray zone in which a compelling case could be made for using two or more very different sets of norms in a given situation. We're going to talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Next slide. So some of the practical things that I can offer for how to start developing uh, contextualized cultural competency in real life as you're practicing um, are going to be in these next few slides here. So first, um, the really important thing that I think is taken for granted is characterizing and comparing your information on at least three levels. The individual level, the test level, and the country or cultural group level. So what do I mean by individual or sample? An individual or sample is the person that you're assessing in your clinic. It's the uh, sample of college students that you're using to collect your dissertation data. It's any of those people in your rehabilitation clinic. Those are the people that you are working with individually one-on-one. Um, -on -one. And so you need to really get to know these people, understand them. This is what your interviews are for, your collateral interviews are for, taking the time to review their medical records and understanding their context and their background. Then we need to understand the test level. So what tests are you gonna be giving to these people? And who are those tests based on, the norms? Are they people that are similar to your individual or your sample? Are they different and how are they different? And this is the third part that is really easy to overlook, is the relationship between your individual and the test and the broader country or cultural group that you're inferring through. So for example, if you're giving a Chilean waste to somebody in Chile, how well does that waste represent the country overall? Was that test normed properly to represent a, to a typical sample of individuals from that group? A lot of times because we think that a test is published by a given publisher, that that is um, a given that uh, they have done their homework, so to speak, and that the tests are um, buttoned down in terms of reliability and validity and um, all of that has been taken care of. And I'm here to tell you that unfortunately that's not true, even if it comes from a very well-known publisher. And so I'm going to illustrate some of the, what that looks like today. But this is why um, in your training, psychometrics is so heavily emphasized in that you need to understand what the tests are and how they relate to the populations that you use, because it is so easy that researchers overlook these relationships. Next slide. So um, this can be very overwhelming in thinking, well, how, what do I look at when I'm looking at these three things? So how can I, you can't possibly be telling me, Dr. Duggan, that when I have a patient coming into my office that I need to do like a full research report on not only every test that I'm using, but also the country where that person comes from or the cultural group. No, but this is also something that you're going to get more well-versed in over time. And it's something that you're going to need to do every time you have an individual from a different cultural context. And so one of the easiest ways to start adapting to the difficulty of um, these types of situations is to focus on the most salient and influential sociodemographic factors. So what research tells us is that education and socioeconomics are two of the most key factors that are gonna affect your interpretation of test results and individuals' performance on those given tests. 
And when I say education, I mean quantity and quality. Um, so for example, um, I have here uh, the homepage of the UNESCO um, Institute for Statistics. And um, sorry, I forgot that we we're gonna maybe do it in this way. So I was gonna maybe show you of looking at this website. But this is a really wonderful website. And if you're on your computer now, um, I suggest that you Google UNESCO, U-N-E-S-C-O, Institute for Statistics. And when you get there, um, you'll see this screen. And if you see that white box in the middle of the screen at the bottom, it says browse by country. And you can literally type in any country in the world and it will bring up all the general information that you would possibly want to know about that country. How much education is typically achieved in that country? What is the education system like? What are the socioeconomics like? How, what percentage of the population lives in a rural area or urban area? Literally, it takes just five minutes to go to this website and give an overview of those key things for you to now have a better sense of that country and some of those key factors that you need to use in your lens of looking at the data. Additionally, um, you can use other resources that I put on the resource list, um, such as CIA Factbook or the World Bank, um, to get other information to help uh, contextualize a country or a cultural group in a very fast way, so that at least you're working from something rather than nothing. And the next slide. So. Once you do those things, you need to really comb the resources and select the appropriate tests and the appropriate norms. Um, and really in the literature of cultural neuropsychology, you'll start to see um, when you're reading closely that people are really saying that lack of resources is no longer an excuse for not working to integrate cultural factors into a neuropsychological assessment. It's no longer sufficient in an assessment to say, you know, this person is from China and cultural factors may influence these results, but I use these US norms and this is just how I'm going to interpret it. There are papers for you to look up and be able to contextualize those results, even if you don't have the tests available. Um, so something is better than nothing. And as we're amassing more resources, it will be um, important for you to kind of keep up with that. And I know it's very overwhelming because literally every day in a clinic that's very busy, you could have an entirely different cultural um, situation that comes through your door. But these are kind of the quick things that you're gonna accumulate over time. And with each patient you see, I recommend kind of looking up an article that kind of covers that unique feature of each person, at least one aspect of the case. And as you amass those resources over time, um, you'll start to develop your competency um, extremely well. Next slide. So let's switch gears and talk about um, using a more concrete example. Um, so I always like starting with intelligence assessment because intelligence is one of those most widely studied constructs in all of psychology. And it's a very important foundation to what we do in neuropsychology. Um, we always need to have an underlying sense of the ability that a person has, is working with, in order to determine how their other cognitive performances fall, whether they're significantly above what the expectations or significantly below the expectations, telling us that there might be some kind of underlying impairment. Um, also, I'm focusing on Latin America and Spanish-speaking individuals um, for two reasons. Uh, one, it's just practical that a lot of my experience is in this area, but two, um, especially in the United States, um, but other countries as well, um, there's a significant call for um, more resources for Latin American populations. And um, after working in Latin America myself as a consultant, I found that a lot of my colleagues really were asking for resources and, you know, I realized the huge disparity between what we have in kind of the Western neuropsychology framework of tools and tests 
um, versus what other places have. And so um, I think it's worth devoting some attention to uh, producing resources that are greatly needed. Uh, next slide here. So um, on these next slides, um, I've done a couple things for you. Um, this is a um, document that I put together for my own personal use. Um, it's not published yet, but it's, a, it's an overview of intelligence assessment tools in Spanish speaking populations in for Latin America. Um, so over the next few slides, um, and Julia, you can click through them. Um, you'll see uh, tests that are the Weschler tests, um, followed by the uh, Rias and the Bateria Trace, which is the Spanish Woodcock Johnson, um, followed by some tests that I have labeled um, kind of lacking research support. Um, followed by some tests that I'm labeling as nonverbal. Um, and for each of these columns here, you'll see that I added um, the name of the test, um, the factor structure, the country that it's specifically developed for, if it's specified, um, the age range, and some specific notes that I have. And so this table is um, developed by um, myself based on some of my research, but also adapted um, from three wonderful authors who have done a lot of work in this area. Um, so I've included uh, this table in that handout for your guys' reference um, so that you have it at your fingertips. Just a caveat, um, I, it's been a couple years I think, since I've updated this. This still should cover most of the things, but there are certainly um, things that I've missed in this document. All right, next slide. Um, um, on the next slide here, we have some other useful resources um, that are truly fantastic. So um, the one on the left here is called the State of Neuropsychological Test Norms for Spanish-Speaking Adults in the United States. Um, we also have a systematic review of neuropsychological tests for um, people of uh, kind of lower abilities. Um, and these are two wonderful resources uh, for all of you um, who might be looking for kind of updates in these areas. Um, but for right now, what I'm going to do is shift gears and talk about a specific example from my own research. Um, so going on to the next slide here. Um, so what I did is a project to examine a cultural assessment scenario in which a case could be made to use a variety of different norms for waste for data from a large sample of uh, individuals from Colombia who are executives. And the interesting thing about these individuals is, you know, they're all healthy and they're all um, very capable, successful individuals. Um, they've often completed uh, undergraduate school, if not graduate school. And um, there was concern that scoring them using Colombian norms versus uh, another set of norms um, is something worth considering. Um, and that using Colombian norms may underestimate their uh, experiences. So um, going on to the next slide here, uh, what we did is we established um, target countries for the comparison. So we looked at these individuals and decided who is most likely, um, what are the groups that they most likely would fall under? Um, you know, based on the education experiences, the travel experiences, um, we decided that we were going to look at Colombian norms, Chilean norms, Mexican norms, Spanish norms, American norms, and Canadian norms, and see what, are, what happens when we take just a a regular person who is very, you know, we have no reason to suspect any impairments at all. They're successful people. And what happens when we apply these norms from different countries to their scores? All right, let's go to the next slide. 
So in this paper, on the next slide, you'll see um, that uh, what we first did was we did what I was telling you, that we wanted to understand our sample and how it compares to the country and to the test. So one of the things that we were most interested in looking at was education. We found that, you know, most of our sample had, uh, all of our sample except for one person actually had post-secondary education. So they had at least some bachelor's uh, education, if not some graduate education. And what we wanted to do was then compare that at the country level. What does that look like at the country level? How common is it for people in Colombia to get education at um, the bachelor's level or the master's level. And so interestingly, um, you can see in this table on the right, um, what I'm doing is we went through and took the international standard of education um, to put the same units of education across all measures. So across our sample, the, some, uh, the countries and the tests. And we looked at um, the rates of education in each population. We found out that in Colombia, at the country level, 20% of the population has pursued similar levels of education as our sample. And in the Colombian WACE, 33% of the sample that was used in the Colombian WACE um, had the same levels of education as our sample. Uh, those numbers were similar in Chile, in Mexico, uh, is a slightly lower percentage of people had higher education. And interestingly, in the Mexican ways, they do not report um, the levels of education achieved um, by their sample. In Spain, 30% of their sample had um, high levels of education. But when you look, or sorry, 30% of the country had high levels of education, but only 9% of their tests had high levels of education. So they're missing about 20% of their sample should be at a higher level of education. Similarly, in the United States and Canada, we have very high levels of education at the country level, and that is pretty adequately represented at the test level as well. So going on in the next slide, um, what we then do is take those scores so what do we get when we take this sample of 305 uh, executives from Colombia and we score their waste with different norms from different countries? So here what you can see on the left is their mean score using Colombian norms. Then we see their um, mean score using Chilean norms, followed by the Mexican norms, the Spanish norms, the US norms, and the Canadian norms. Interestingly, all of these are statistically different except for the Mexican and Spanish norms, which are, is indicated with the solid bars. Um, although the difference between Colombian and Chilean norms is really only one half of one point. On the graph on the right, we can look at the distribution of the scores for the entire sample based on their mean FSIQ. And what's interesting is that you see the black line is the Colombian sample. So we have Colombian individuals scored with Colombian norms. This is what we would think is their kind of most idealistic uh, representation if these are the appropriate norms. In Chile, you are then taking that same sample using the Chilean norms as the green line. Mexican is the light blue line. Spain is the kind of purple line. US is orange and Canadian is red. And what you see is happening as we score the sample using these different sets of norms is, you know, for the Colombian and the Chilean norms, we get the same result. But when we score using different norms, um, then we start changing the distribution of these scores to the extent that by the time we get down to the US or the Canadian norms, we have shifted the overall mean from um, kind of in between the high average to superior range all the way down to average with some of our individuals if you look at the left falling in the borderline range which is shocking um, you know that some people could end up making the case of maybe we should use these US norms or the Canadian norms for these individuals but really what we're going to be doing is underestimating their performance 
and their underlying true abilities. Going on to the next slide, uh, we can see um, then what the distribution looks like on different uh, indices, verbal comprehension, perceptual reasoning, working memory, and processing speed. Um, I'll draw your attention to the fact that the perceptual reasoning, processing speed, and working memory, memory indices are all fairly similar. Um, we have kind of similar distribution of um, scores. But the verbal comprehension index, we have completely skewed um, changes. So the Mexican and the Spanish norms produce higher scores, the Canadian and the US norms produce lower scores, and then the Chilean and the Colombian uh, norms are in the middle. Going to the next slide, we can also see um, what happens when we look at these scores individually. So right now we've been looking at the means up to this point, but what happens if we take every individual score and look of how it's following into its um, agreement with its clinical classification? So clinical classification meaning average, superior, um, high average, low average, so forth. So every person, every Colombian individual, when they were scored with Chilean norms, had 100% agreement across the indices of their scores. But then you see if we apply the Mexican norms to these individuals, only 89% of the full-scale IQs held within that same clinical classification, whereas only 21% of those individuals retained their full-scale IQ clinical classification. Interestingly, looking at verbal IQ, you can see that at least 50% across all the norms are being retained within the same clinical classification. Whereas things like working memory and processing speed are actually having lower um, concordance rates. Going on to the next slide, um, we can also look at the individual test level and based on individuals to see which tests are more frequently consistent in the clinical classification for individuals. Interestingly, the highest agreement was on tests like vocabulary, information, and cancellation. And I can't tell you how many times people are just frankly shocked when I present this uh, finding because it's, you know, it's going back to that, what are the assumptions that you're bringing into the process? And I think one of the assumptions that most of us maybe bring into this process is that um, tests like vocabulary or information are culturally not fair and that they're going to cause problems. But um, when we're looking at these findings that, you know, these tests that have been adapted, albeit a, a little bit, but not a lot, um, you know, it's the identical test um, as the US version or the Canadian version of the test, um, we're having a lot of concordance. Cancellation also has a, hot, a lot of agreement um, in the fact that I think there's a high ceiling effect and um, there's uh, not a lot of variability in there. Um, whereas on some other tasks here, we see that the lowest agreement is on things that would surprise us, including coding and digit span. Going on to the next slide. Um, so what are the things that we took away from this study? Um, so first we found that Colombian and Chilean norms yielded systematically similar scores. And um, this is an important finding because a lot of uh, psychologists and neuropsychologists in Latin America might be able to only afford one or the other tests. Um, and this shows us that they can maybe use um, these tests uh, somewhat interchangeably, although the, these findings are for um, kind of a normative intact population and other research would be needed to look at the other ends of the distribution. Um, we found incrementally lower scores uh, with Mexico, Spain, Canada, and the United States, but it's worth uh, explicitly noting that that is not because individuals from those Latin American countries um, in South America put in those contexts are any less intelligent. That is a completely misguided interpretation that sometimes I still hear people kind of falling into. So it's important for all of us to remember that culture is key. Um, the cultural influences that we grow up in, which include uh, education and socioeconomics, but also cultural factors like uh, tempo. How, how much is it valued to answer quickly? 
or how much is it valued to answer in a way that is inclusive of other people's ideas? These things all affect um, performance on tests, especially like intelligence tests. Additionally, the verbal tests have different patterns of scores across the different versions of the ways. And that's speaking to the underlying differences in the norming process across these different countries. And you'll think back to that slide that I showed you of the representation of education in the different normative samples. And this really speaks to maybe there's some problems within the Mexican and Spanish norms where we're not getting the correct representation of uh, higher levels and lower levels of education compared to the general population. And therefore it's skewing different um, portions of the test into a different uh, pattern of uh, scores. Additionally, um, the study found that working memory and processing speed scores overall had the lowest agreement um, across the norms, um, whereas the composite score of FSIQ had the most agreement, which makes sense psychometrically. Going on to the next slide. So um, some key takeaways from this is um, that using norms from other uh, contexts it's tempting, you know, it was tempting to say, okay, this sample of individuals, they're very successful. A lot of them have been to American schools um, or have had very advanced levels of private education. But at the end of the day, it's not apples to apples to take that one piece of their life and um, separate it from everything else and use other norms. Um, but the only way to truly demonstrate this is by an empirical approach. Um, and so a lot of times what neuropsychologists will do in individual cases is apply multiple sets of norms to actually see what the effects are and then look at the bigger picture in the context to have a better understanding of how to interpret the findings. And I think that's a very important thing to take away. Going on to the next slide. Um, some other things that um, happen in psychometrics that can be overlooked is kind of not looking at under the hood of the test. Um, and I alluded to this before, but um, it's worth kind of coming back to. So for example, um, here we have uh, the factor structure on the left of the waste bore in the United States. And, you know, a part of why I'm centering on the waste is um, because it is the most widely used intelligence assessment in all of the world. Um, it's been translated in many languages and adapted to many cultures. But interestingly, um, it has not been normed in the same way across every country and every culture. Often Pearson will have um, groups of researchers in different countries decide how they want to do that process. Um, so it's important to understand how a test is normed, even if it has the same name as the test that you, your, your friendly test that you use every day. Um, also, there's some interesting things that um, test developers do. And if you don't have a strong psychometrics background, it's worth knowing that, you know, for the original ways four, um, they actually cross-loaded some of the tests into getting kind of the most ideal factor structure for the ways. So for example, arithmetic is not only a working memory test, but actually it's a considered a verbal comprehension test. When you calculate the scores on the waste floor, that the score of arithmetic only goes into the working memory. But when you're considering the factor, factor structure of the full scale IQ, what they're doing is considering arithmetic also a verbal comprehension test. And there's a lot of research that is used to kind of look at the factor structure and then support the validity and the reliability of the test using that assumption. However, some of my preliminary research looking at the factor structure in Chile, for example, using the normative sample for the waste board there, has shown that that uh, underlying assumption of arithmetic as also a verbal comprehension um, loading factor is not true. And that has implications for um, how we interpret what the construct validity of some tests are. You know, this is a very minor example, but overall, if you're looking at a test and they're not reporting the factor structure, and it's a test that has composite scores or composite indices, um, that's a huge red flag. Um, and that's something that you need to be aware of because you cannot assume 
that a test is measuring the same constructs across different cultures. Going on to the next slide, um, I also get at this in a different way. Um, so within uh, psychometrics, uh, we also, in test development, um, will develop tests that are short forms. And you know, short forms are becoming out of favor in the United States because we have a lot of resources and we have the luxury of being able to develop a, you know, very robust uh, psychometric tools. But in a lot of countries, um, they just don't have a lot of resources to be able to do this well. Um, it's very, very expensive to make new tests. And so if we can find ways um, to give researchers the resources that they need to do their job while we're working to um, help catch them up so that they have just as many tools as we do, um, then that's important. But it's important to realize that kind of the underlying psychometrics framework that we use to create a lot of these measures was developed in the early 20th century. And those methods do not include these cultural factors. So for example, in this um, work that I've been developing and um, that will be coming out soon, um, we took the waste standardization data and I took the um, original methods that are published in the literature um, of how to develop a short form, but added some additional steps to make it a culturally sound process. So this includes looking at the factor structure and then deriving short forms of a test based on the factor structure that is appropriate for that given culture so that we're not inherently um, emphasizing uh, subtests that have little um, uh, validity uh, when we distill it down in this process. All right. Um, just wrapping up on a few things. We'll go to the next slide here. And I want to talk about where is cultural neuropsychology going? Um, so I think uh, cultural neuropsychology is going a lot of really exciting places. Um, I think we're still, uh, there we go. Um, so cultural neuropsychology is going to a lot of really exciting places. Um, I think you know, every day, um, I think, you know, we're seeing development towards um, more open mindset amongst our colleagues, uh, people who are um, integrating these frameworks, uh, programs that are integrating this into their education. Um, every month, I get articles um, for journals to review on new measures and new norms to use. And um, I think a lot of wonderful work is uh, happening in this area. Um, there's a couple other things that we can do though. Um, and the next slide, I show um, one of the things that I uh, presented at the Hispanic Neuropsychological Society, um, which is some recommendations that I developed on disseminating cultural neuropsychology research. So on this uh, next slide here, um, I you know provide some outlines on um, what you can do if you work in this area of how do you get your research out there? Um, and I think it's really important for people to know that, um, you know, disseminating your work in this area is vitally important because it's how we build things. And, you know, if uh, different groups are working uh, to try to catch up, so to speak, to having just as many tools as we do in the Western neuropsychology framework, um, then we need to get creative of how we're going about that. So I encourage people who work in this area to um, work with publishers. Um, a lot of people don't realize, but you can work with publishers to get your articles translated. Um, you should really make sure that you're reporting your information in an accessible way, such as education. Um, report your education levels in a way that people from the countries that might consume this research can understand them. Um, there are actually empirically supported uh, knowledge dissemination frameworks that have been developed. And so a lot of you who are writing grants or scholarships um, and you need to kind of develop a plan for how you're going to dis disseminate your research, um, I encourage you to actually look at these empirically supported guidelines um, because that will make you stand out and give you a really solid plan for how to move forward. 
Um, collaboration is key in this field and um, providing clear applications for what comes next um, and what your research means to the people who are going to consume it is very important. Um, don't take those things for granted because they need to spell out. And the last slide here, um, I think, um, you know, one of the other things that's really exciting and what's coming in this field is um, epidemiological research. Um, so I've been working with Dr. David Shrutland at Hopkins, who's developed this uh, Global Neuropsychology uh, Inc., which is a nonprofit foundation, um, which aim is to really promote global health. And one of the key projects that we've been working on is a neuropsychological assessment instrument to use in multiple languages worldwide. Um, and eventually um, where I think the field is going is development of epidemiological norms so that we have so much data from each country that we can literally norm for rural, urban, language, region, you know, all of those different things in kind of uh, regression-based norms. Um, so this is a, a project that's underway and if you have more questions about it or you would like to um, be a part of the process. Um, we do have collaborators and you can come talk, contact us there um, at that email address. Additionally, um, if you're all shopping during your quarantine time on Amazon, um, you can select to donate money to GNI um, from the proceeds uh, through the SMILE um, function on Amazon. And lastly, um, I think teleneuropsychology in the face of um, on, on this next slide here, teleneuropsychology is uh, exciting because uh, it's opening up the world uh, for what we can do and resources that we can deliver to people in regions that might not be able to be easily access, um, accessible to hospitals and neuropsychologists. Um, also individuals who speak languages that it's hard to find a neuropsychologist who are competent in those languages. Um, teleneuropsychology opens up the world for them to have assessments in different places and a lot of work is being done um, you know every minute of every day right now in the face of this to help uh, open up teleneuropsychology and telehealth uh, in ways that are just unprecedented for um, medicine so that is really exciting all right um, so with that um, on the last slide here um, we have uh, just another presentation next week that I'd love for you guys to join. Um, Dr. Alexander Tian is going to talk about integrating the scientist practitioner perspective into clinical practice. Um, and now I'll be happy to take any of your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Duggan. That was really um, an excellent presentation. I think it covered a lot of good broad areas um, with some practical take homes as well. Um, we have a few questions and I know we only have a few minutes, so we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, first questions are related mostly to clinical practice. Um, so one question asks about the UNESCO website that you mentioned. So what are some of the ways that you might use the UNESCO website practically? For example, even if you know what the literacy rate is in a country, how would you choose what uh, test to use or what appropriate norms might be um, best? And do you mention that in your report or are there other things related to culture that you mentioned in the report? Um, that's an excellent point. Um, and you know, that integrates a lot of things. Um, so first in using something like the UNESCO website, um, it's not necessarily something that I put um, as like a reference and a report, but something to further my knowledge. Um, so it's very often that I'll get a patient who was born, you know, maybe in the 1950s in Thailand or, you know, in the 1980s in Colombia. You know, someone who was born in the 1980s in Colombia versus someone who was born in the 1920s in Colombia are two very different people with two very different lives, um, lives that are affected by conflict and access to education. And so um, I think some of that is just kind of doing my due diligence, so to speak, of kind of filling in the gaps and understanding, you know, when someone says, you know, I grew up here or I grew up in this region or I went to this kind of school, um, it's good to kind of check what that means. Um, so these are kind of fact checking in a way. Um, uh, 
um, what patients say um, and to kind of clearly understand when they say I graduated, does that mean that you graduated 10 compulsory years or 12 compulsory years? Because that's different in different countries. Um, and so that helps me then in my report, it might say something like, patient, you know, completed the 10 compulsory years of education um, that is expected in this country. Um, and so that helps me have a better context of where I'm um, looking at them. In terms of, Julia, could you remind me kind of the second part of that question? Sure. Um, are there other things related to culture that you might mention in your report if you don't necessarily mention that you used a specific norm group, for example? Yes, absolutely. Um, so culture is everywhere in my report. Um, it's at the beginning when I introduce the patient. Um, it's in the uh, behavioral observations, in how the patient is interacting with me, if they're there with family, um, understanding the context of who, the dynamics of who wants to talk. Um, it's there in um, my caveats about the interpretation and the validity of the findings. Um, so it all always, if I have a patient that is in um, a, a cultural context that is not within kind of the given norm of the place where I'm practicing, um, I will put a caveat saying, you know, efforts have been made to interpret these findings with this context, but there's still some um, uh, uh, difficulty associated with that. Um, there's kind of a, a specific phrase that I crafted along those lines. Um, additionally, I will look up articles. So for example, I had a patient who um, had primary progressive aphasia and was uh, lived in China most of his life. Um, and he had an unusual pattern of verbal scores. And so I wanted to kind of look at the effects of bilingualism and uh, Chinese language uh, in that score. And there was actually a paper that was published on that. There are so many papers out there that you don't realize are available. Um, and so you can cite those in your reports and they're very useful. A lot of your providers though, they don't care to know the nitty gritty, they wanna know what they take away. So if you can kind of do all the background but then summarize it in just one short sentence so that they understand what it means at the end of the day, those are kind of the things that people care about the most. Perfect. Um, the next question is re in regards to uh, Latinx clients in the US. Um, would you measure level of acculturation with use of the ARSMA or the BAS, for example? Um, how does that factor into how we account for patients' culture? Mm -hmm. um, yes, and I am aware that I um, completely glided over um, acculturation, which is a huge, huge um, point. Um, but one that is embedded in those slides earlier of the guidelines that I went over. Um, and one that Dr. Fuji really eloquently covers in his presentation, and since he, he just presented the other day, I didn't want to double up too much on what he was presenting. Um, but yeah, there's uh, several different guidelines for acculturation. Um, the ones that you mentioned, you know, they're perfectly fine. I think really um, it's more about the uh, the spirit uh, rather than the logistics at the end of the day of really understanding um, the acculturation process for any individual, I think always at a minimum, you need to assess uh, acculturation for any given individual, especially those who have immigrated to the United States or who are refugees, um, and then describing that. Um, so it's worth taking the time in your reports to describe what is a patient's first language, what is a patient's preferred language, what is the language that they use normally at home? What is the language that they use at work? If you're having trouble figuring out, you know, if they're having aphasia or other things, does the family have videos or emails that they wrote in the past? You know, so that you can watch them and compare them to how they are now. Um, so really getting a sense of who they are as a person is very, very important. Um, and I think um, if anybody has not really used an acculturation uh, framework before um, one of those assessments, um, I certainly encourage everyone to take a good look at them and bring them to your supervisors and into your clinics and use them as a, a guideline. Okay, I realize that it is three o'clock. Um, there is one other question, well, two that we can collapse into one if 
if you have time for another couple of minutes. Yeah. Would that be okay? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So this question uh, relates to, let's see, the quality of education uh, versus private versus public school. Um, and how do you assess that? And I'm going to collapse a pediatric um, question in there. <laughs> Has there been research done on pediatrics? So in my head, I'm seeing this question maybe being more relevant for pediatrics. If you know the level of, of education in a specific country or region, for example, how do you assess the quality versus the number of years? That is a very good and very tough question to answer um, that I don't think has any kind of perfect answers, um, but there's a couple things that are kind of worth um, highlighting. Um, one, I apologize um, because I'm definitely um, more of a neuropsychologist who works with adults. Um, and I uh, definitely did not include very many resources on pediatrics on that side of things. Um, but there are pediatric resources available, I think less than on the adult side, but I think that's being developed. Um, and I would have to consult with some of my colleagues who kind of work in that area um, for specific recommendations on intelligence assessment in this area. Um, second, in terms of assessing quality of education, um, you know, things like private and public, um, that depends on the school or the culture that you're in, the country that you're in. So for example, I did my PhD in Canada and um, a public institution for graduate school is actually a lot different than a private institution. And it's kind of the opposite of how it is in the United States. So even in a culture that is very similar to ours, um, you really have to understand um, what that connotation means. Um, so, that's kind of helpful of going back to things like the UNESCO website and just getting a vibe for what is kind of normal and typical um, and then going from there. Um, if somebody's in a British school or a US uh, based curriculum or achieving an international baccalaureate or you know some kind of standard that is more uniform that is very telling of one type of education versus the others but um, at the end of the day, if you're really unsure and um, are at a loss for how to kind of understand that context of quality of education, um, estimates of pre-morbid function are very useful and reading levels are very useful. So if you can get a reading level um, and literacy, you know, literacy and reading level is, you know, one of the biggest uh, associations with uh, quality of education and so if you can get um, a good read on that there's lots of reading level measures in other languages um, you would need to work with the appropriate professionals or interpreters in order to at least assess that at a bare minimum but that's a good place to start Great. Well, thank you so much for um, this awesome presentation and thank you so much everyone for joining us this week um, we'll be back next week with our talk with Dr. Tan. Thank you, everyone.